and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jennifer and I'm an expat living in Dubai with my French husband Laurent and my two daughters, Ayla who's three and Iris who's 15 months. Before becoming a stay-at-home mom, I was an early years in primary school teacher and now I create content about motherhood, parenting and homeschooling. So if that's content that interests you, then please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you my top 10 tips for encouraging your little one to engage in independent play. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Independent play is absolutely crucial for young children to develop their critical thinking skills, their creativity, as well as their self-confidence. And it's also important that parents themselves get a little bit of downtime during the day. So here are my top 10 tips to help you get your little one engaged in independent play. So my first top tip for engaging your child in independent play is to allow your child to be bored. It's really, really important to note that when newborns come into the world, they're already very interested and engaged in the world around them. They don't need a performer. They don't need someone to entertain them constantly. Yet Yes, they need physical contact with you. Yes, they need cuddles and kisses and to be reassured. Um, and of course, they get that one on one time at meal times, um, at nappy changes, and all of this time during the day. It all counts towards having that one to one attention from you. But when it comes to playtime, your child really doesn't need you um, in order to entertain them. They're very capable. Children are born with the ability to use their creativity and their imagination in order to use the things that they have available to them in order to come up with new ideas, in order to create create and in order to engage in imaginative play. They don't need you to do that for them. My top tip number two is to engage your child in practical life activities around the house. Uh, so whether that's getting them outside and watering the plants or giving them a squidgy and a little cloth so that they can uh, wash the windows or maybe it's um, filling up the sink and putting some dishes in for your child to wash the dishes. Uh, whatever it is that you can get your child engaged with around the house, it really, really helps to build your child's self-confidence. And also because they're helping you and they're engaged with you during that time, it really fills up their emotional cup so that when it comes time to actually playing, they are quite happy to play alone because they've already had that quality time with you. My top tip number three to engage your child in independent play is to actually observe your child, take the time to sit back and watch your child. What toys and activities really engage your child? What are they interested in? Uh, what possible schemas or ses sensitive periods might your child be in just now? Um, if you're not sure about schemas or sensitive periods, then please check out the links in the description box. I've got two videos for you. Um, so really you want to watch your child, observe them and see what it is that really interests them. What activities um, are they spending a lot of time with uh, by themselves? And then you want to provide more of uh, similar type activities. So for example, if you see your toddler is really into uh, posting things, for example, um, posting little lolly sticks into a bottle, for example, you might uh, provide them with some pom-poms so that they can extend the activity. Um, maybe you could provide different containers and different small items for them to post into different uh, containers. And this will really extend uh, that interest that they have. It will really satisfy them so that they're not coming in looking for you because there's nothing really engaging for them to do. Um, so it's really, really important to find out what your child is interested in, what will engage them for long periods of time, and that will really help them to really participate in independent play independently. My top tip number four is I differentiate uh, play um, in terms of playing with open-ended materials and toys to Montessori materials. And although it's all play, um, I do differentiate the two in my home. For example, I have Isla's shelf work on our Montessori shelf in the classroom, and I have all the open-ended toys in the playroom. And the reason I do that is because the Montessori materials are materials that very often need to be demonstrated. Um, not always, sometimes they are self-correcting and quite obvious as to what you're supposed to do with them. For example, if I put 
put a puzzle on the shelf and it's dismantled and the pieces are in a basket on top of the board. It's very obvious what the challenge is there. But for some of the Montessori, traditional Montessori activities, for example, uh, the pink tower or the brown stairs or the knob cylinders, um, some of these activities, it's good to give a demonstration to your child as to what the purpose of them uh, actually is because these are closed ended activities. So um, they do need to be demonstrated so that the child actually knows what they're supposed to do with it. There, there's a particular purpose. However, when you are looking for your child to engage in independent, open-ended play that's using their imagination and their creativity, the best thing to do is to leave your child be. So if you have, for example, some blocks or a train set, it's really good if you just let your child explore the materials for themselves rather than um, getting in too involved. Um, it's really good to actually wait for your invitation to play. So if your child hasn't invited you to come and play with them, it's a really good idea just to sit on your hands, go and get yourself a cup of coffee, go get yourself a book. You haven't been invited to play, maybe you've got some chores that you'd like to get on with. Until your child actually invites you into the play, there's really no need. You don't need to show them how to use any of the open-ended toys, just let them use their imagination and creativity. My top tip number five in order to get your child engaged in independent play is to actually engage in play with your child when you are invited in and um, get them started um, let them lead you in terms of what they want you to say, who they want you to be and um, what how they want you to participate in the play. And um, this can be quite frustrating for adults, um, especially when you have your own opinion as to what your, char your characters are going to say, what your characters are going to do, but you are actually taking part in your child's narrative. If you imagine your child is the director of the movie and you are just one of the actors, you really need to take your child's lead during the play and be a sort of passive participant in the play. And then once the game is sort of up and running, you can slip away to do something else. So for example, something that I might have said to Isla when she was really little and she was inviting me into her play, um, I would play for a few minutes and I'd say, oh, I'm just gonna go put the kettle on for a cup of tea. And then once I go and put the kettle on, I would observe her from a distance and see that she was getting on with the play by herself. She wasn't looking for me, so she was fully engaged in the imaginative play that she had designed. Um, so it's really, really important to follow your child's lead, let them be the director, you just be the actor, and slip away when you're no longer required for the play. Um, observe them from a distance. If they're getting on fine, then that is your cue to leave. My top tip number six for engaging your child in independent play is to stay nearby whilst they're playing. So for example, for us, uh, we actually changed our living room into uh, our playroom because we have a sort of open planned um, downstairs. Um, so whilst I'm in the kitchen, for example, I can still see the children, I can still uh, talk with them, so it's all very open plan. And this is ideal because uh, it means that I can get on with things that I would like to do, um, whether that's just doing the dishes or prepping some snacks or even doing some editing. Um, and I can still be nearby whilst the girls are playing. And um, very often I'll just grab a coffee and I'll just sit in the playroom whilst they're playing um, and just being there and observing the girls whilst they're at play. And this is the best really because your children will feel calm and secure that you're nearby. They don't have to come look for you. Um, and they kind of feel as if you are engaged in a bit of parallel play. So just like they play with other children, they would play in the same space as another child, but not necessarily uh, cooperatively. But children very often play really, really well um, in parallel play because they have that comfort that they're surrounded by other people, but they're not actually interacting. And um, they're just getting on with their own piece of work. And really that's what you can do as well. You can get on with something else uh, whilst being in the presence of your child and they will feel that comfort and security. My top tip number seven, for engaging your child in independent play is to make sure that you're not interfering in their play. So as long as your child is not uh, damaging anything in the environment and they're not hurting themselves or others, it's a really good idea just to step back and just let them uh, play quietly. You don't have to interrupt them with suggestions and you don't need to praise them when uh, they're doing something that you approve of. 
and you certainly don't need to give any comments whilst they're playing because really all you're doing is interrupting the flow of their play and I've witnessed that a few times. Um, Isla has been playing with her dollies and they're in a conversation and one of them will say, um, oh mummy, and I'll think that she's talking to me and I'll say, yes, I love, what is it? And she'll be like, no, 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 mummy, stop talking to me, I'm busy. Um, and I've interrupted the flow of the conversation that her little characters were having. And if you break them from that concentration, it's almost like snapping someone out of hypnosis. They, they find it quite difficult just to slip back in immediately. And also I found, especially when I was a teacher in the classroom, uh, even just making eye contact is enough to break a child's concentration. Um, and you'll find this definitely with young toddlers that if they're busy doing something and you're looking at them and they turn their head and you meet eyes, all of a sudden they want you and they come crawling over to you and they want cuddles, they want attention from you. But had you not made that eye contact, they would have just be, they would have been fine on their own. Um, so really you want to be as passive as possible. You almost want to be like one of those people who study animals um, you know, out in the wild, like not making eye contact, uh, just look, keeping your head down, being quiet um, and just observing your child passively um, and really not interrupting them if possible. My top tip number eight for engaging your child in independent play is to rotate shelf work. And what do I mean by this? Um, I've got a few videos, one video in particular where I talk about how I rotate activities and how I store activities that we're not using at the moment. But what I do for the girls is I observe them in their play. I see what interests they have, what schemas they might be in, what sensitive periods they might be in. And I try to provide activities that really support their natural development in that moment. And then I observe them again and during a, a period of time, maybe over a week, two weeks, it could be a month, um, and I will see which activities the girls are still using, which activities they're returning to, and which activities are being ignored, which activities are not working, are too challenging, too easy. And then those activities, I will remove them and I will look in my cupboards and I will see what else I can put out for them that will engage them and again, support their natural development um, and their interests, their schemas and their sensitive periods. And by doing this, I'm doing two things. I'm not only making sure that all the activities that I've provided for the girls actually uh, suit them, uh, suit their needs, their age, their stage, their interests, which will really engage them for longer periods of time, but I'm also refreshing the activities and toys that we already have. It's almost like they've got a brand new toy, and when they come downstairs and they see brand new shelves, brand new activities, uh, they're not new at all. They are just toys that we had hidden away for a little while. So it's a really good idea just to um, take some of the toys uh, away from your playroom or away from their bedroom, um, hide them, put them away, and and then every so often you can swap out the toys and this will engage your child for a lot longer in independent play. My top tip number nine for engaging your child in independent play is to provide your child with sensory play and outdoor play. These two types of play are really important for young children. And um, from the ages of birth to six, children are engaged in learning through their senses. And that is why you will constantly see posts and things on Instagram and YouTube and things about sensitive play. I actually have a series all about different sensory play activities that you can do and I will link it down below in the description box. Uh, please check that out because it's full of sensory play that is messy, not messy, and uh, that's indoor, outdoor. I have so many different ideas for different age groups as well. Um, so please check that out. But sensory play is really important for children and um, that they are engaging with different smells, different textures, um, even different temperatures, cold and hot. And this will not only develop their learning about the world around them, but it will also develop their language skills um, as you're describing all of these things as well. Is it squelchy? Is it cold? Is it crunchy? And these are all great words as well. Once you get your child used to using sensory play materials, you can really teach your child to keep everything quite orderly or at least contained within a space. Uh, this might take some practice to begin with, um, but if you give a designated area for your child to engage in sensory play, really this can go on for a long, long time and you'll find that they can engage in independent play for a lot longer 
um, in this sort of type of play than with others. Even sensory play that's as simple as sand or water play, you can provide your child with scoops and with spoons and with little jugs. And if all of this is a little bit too intimidating for you, perhaps um, you really just can't deal with any kind of mess, you can provide sensory play just with Play-Doh. You can add different scents. You can even add little herbs and things into Play-Doh, oats, and um, just to give it a little bit of texture. You could also just take your child outside if you have a garden or you have access to um, an outdoor space. This is really great for young children to get outside, get into the dirt, get into the germs and things that will really build up their immune system as well. You can take your child for a walk if, you're, if you don't have access to an outdoor space like a garden. Uh, you can take your child for a nature walk. Um, if you have any wooded areas or any greenery around, um, you could pick up leaves and sticks and things, bring them back home uh, for your child to explore later. Um, it's a really, really great idea to collect different things that you find in nature. Um, it's not only great for your child in their learning, but they're also great additions to independent play in terms of loose parts, um, things that they can use for different kinds of creative play. Taking your child to the park is another great one because not only might you meet other children there that they can play with and engage with, again, that will uh, give you some downtime as well, maybe to sit and uh, listen to a podcast or something like that whilst your child is playing with others. It also allows your child to have that physical gross motor play which is really important for them, get out in the fresh air um, and parks are always great for independent play and when Iris was really little and she wasn't quite crawling yet it was so amazing. I would take a picnic blanket and just some simple snacks like pouches and maybe maybe some uh, some fruit with us and we walk along to the park and Isla can can engage in her gross motor and creative play and imaginative play um, independently and I could sit with Iris on the picnic blanket and I could chat to her, talk about the birds and the things that we could see around us and really it was such a relaxing experience. And finally my top tip number 10 for engaging your child in independent play is to switch off the screens and um, just make sure that you are limiting that screen time because if you have seen my video all about screen time and the harmful effects it can actually have on young children and um, it will really really affect your child's ability to entertain themselves because screens really give you that immediate uh, satisfaction, that immediate stimuli um, and you're being entertained, it makes it a lot more difficult for children to entertain themselves and to be bored and to use things creatively if they're used to just being entertained all the time. So that's it. I hope that video was helpful to you. Please let me know in the comments below if you've got any other tips for encouraging your little ones to engage in independent play. Otherwise, subscribe if you're new and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.